So you might have noticed I have changed the title of my talk. I very clearly cannot tell you about the IP strategy at Blue Rock. It's highly confidential. <laughs> so I've changed it. And I've tried to bridge the gap between the information that you've learned from the other three speakers this morning. We learned about patent prosecution generally, how you obtain a patent. We learned about how you search the patent databases. And now we've learned about how you translate your technology to your tech transfer office and how they bridge the gap with industry. So I am in industry, and at my company, we work with all sorts of tech transfer offices. So I've tried to frame my talk in terms of the commercial value of IP and how that's important to a company like Blue Rock. Standard disclaimer, any opinions I provide are mine, not those of Blue Rock. And although we're talking about legal issues, none of this should be construed as legal advice or an offer of service. So what we're going to go through today, I'm going to give you a brief intro to Blue Rock Therapeutics um, in case you're interested in what we are doing. I hope you are. Then we'll talk about why a company might invest in IP, and in particular, why it's important in the life science space. We'll talk about how a company might generate and build a valuable IP portfolio. And then I'm going to sum it up with a brief description of how an IP strategy actually fits in a broader corporate strategy, because this stuff is all aligned and intertwined. We're not siloed. Blue Rock Therapeutics. This is the only slide I'm going to give you on Blue Rock. So I joined Blue Rock about uh, almost a year and a half ago now. Um, and Blue Rock is a company, a startup company, that was launched at the end of 2016. We are backed by a venture firm called Versant Ventures and Bayer, Ther Bayer Pharmaceuticals, German ther pharmaceutical company. So Bayer and Versant invested a substantial amount of money to launch Blue Rock, $225 million Series A round. And they did that by pulling together the basis for the technology that Blue Rock would work on. So they did this by in licensing intellectual property and engaging key opinion leaders as our scientific co founders and advisors. So the key pieces to Blue Rock Therapeutics are that we are an engineered cell therapy company. We have a cell platform that we use as the basis for all of our products. That's a pluripotent stem cell platform. The platform is engineered in part to reduce immunogenicity so that we can generate allogeneic cell therapies. That means unlike the CAR T cell therapies that we saw in the earlier video, this would be an off the shelf product where the same product could be applied to me and my immune system would not reject it. The same product, product could be applied to you and your immune system would not reject it. Um, and then we can take those pluripotent stem cells and develop them into a variety of different cell types for therapeutic use. We have three major um, categories of cell types and therapeutics at Blue Rocks. We have a neural program. Our lead candidate in the neural program is a dopaminergic neuron product. So this is a neuron specific to the midbrain that produces dopamine. And this cell type is missing and it's died in patients with Parkinson's disease. So all of the cell therapeutics that Blue Rock is working on, they're all targeted at repairing the cell damage that is occurring in degenerative diseases. So we replace the cells with new healthy cells that have the function that are lacking in those damaged or dead cells. Uh, that pipeline um, should be entering the clinic at the end of this year. So that relationship was established with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City and with two of our scientific co-founders, Lorenz Studer and Vivian Tabar. Lorenz is a developmental biologist who figured out how to make these neurons from stem cells. And Vivian is the chief of neurosurgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They are a power couple. 
So Vivian will be our surgeon who will deliver these cell therapeutics to the patients in our phase one trial. And in building this company, those relationships had to be established and papered. The second main program we're working on at Blue Rocks is a cardiac program. And that is based on a relationship we have with the UHN here in Toronto. So two of our other co-founders are Gordon Keller and Mike Laflamme. And Gordon Keller is a developmental biologist with particular expertise in developing cardiac cells from pluripotent stem cells. He actually does all sorts of other cell types too, but cardiac's what we'll talk about first. And then Mike Laflamme, like Vivian, he is our clinical translation expert. He, this is an earlier stage program. He's doing all of the animal model work. We're working in a pig model there. So that's the second part. The third, third main therapeutic indication that Blue Rock is targeting is immune cells. And immune cells for tolerance in the host of engrafted tissue that is non-self, and immune cells for therapeutic function on their own. And those are earlier stage pipelines. So that's Blue Rock Therapeutics. Why, why the story of IP and Blue Rock Therapeutics? From that, I hope you can hear that IP was very important in the founding of Blue Rock. It couldn't have been founded without accessing all of that IP at the outset. Nobody would have invested in it if it wasn't clear that we would have the space to work and further develop these pharmaceutical products. And in that, um, I was the seventh employee hired at Blue Rock. So clearly it was important to get, get out ahead of it. Um, I think now we might be up to 70 people. So we're growing quickly. That's all I'm going to say about Blue Rock for now. I'm glad to talk about that later on if you have any questions. So we've talked a lot about IP this morning. Why invest in IP? So Catherine, you touched on this this morning with your opening slides in particular. There's real value in IP, and there's real risk in clinical development of products. You put a lot of money in, a lot of resources in before you get to a product. So why do you invest in it? You invest in IP to generate value. And I put this up here. I think you can see it at least a little bit. This is a patent. It's granted. The subject matter of this patent is directed to a watch that will tell time in dog years. So it's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek example, but the purpose of it is to take a step back and ask yourself, why are we trying to protect an invention with a patent? What value could that bring to your company, to a potential investor, to a potential company that you want to market your invention to? What's the real value? And I would suggest that the real value at the heart of all of this is how is your IP going to support a competitive advantage for a company? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Competitive advantage, what does that mean? Likely you'll talk about it more this afternoon um, in the entrepreneurial section. But I would suggest a competitive advantage is what makes your goods or services superior to all other choices that a customer has. Maybe a customer doesn't have another choice, in which case that is your competitive advantage. You're the only one there. But most times, a customer has another choice. Why are they going to choose your product rather than somebody else's? They may choose it because your product has some sort of benefit that they're specifically interested in. And benefits I categorize generally into increases or decreases. So increased function, increased therapeutic efficacy. That's clearly something on our list of things we're interested in. Increased shelf life stability, increased ease of delivery, decreases, decreased toxicity, decreased side effects, decreased cost. Those are all things that might benefit you um, and lead to a competitive advantage. Target market is something else to consider when you're thinking about your competitive advantage and how IP might support it. Who's actually paying for your product? And this is relevant in this space because it's usually not the patient. 
it's usually the buyer of the drugs, and usually those are big buying organizations. So you need to understand who makes those decisions, buying decisions, and what criteria they use to make their decisions. And can you do anything with your IP portfolio to make it more attractive to that buyer? Competition. Clearly you need to understand who your competition is and what it is they're making. And here you have to cast your net a little broader sometimes than you might initially think because their, their product might not be an apples to apples comparison because maybe they're solving the same problem in a very different way. For therapeutics, usually it's a drug to drug option, but maybe there's a lifestyle option and there's something that you would pay for there that a patient would choose or a, a like an HMO in the States who would buy these things or put them on their, um, on your insurance, maybe they, would, maybe they would prefer a lifestyle package rather than a drug. So think broadly there. And there you want to focus on what do your competitors do differently than you. Understanding that is very relevant to your IP strategy and focusing on that competitive advantage. The last bullet point I have here is revenue. Clearly all of this is a very expensive field to work in and anything you can do to generate revenue should help you achieve the competitive advantage. At the outset of a startup like Blue Rock, that was our initial fundraising. We needed to get ourselves going. You can't enter this field without a whole bunch of licenses and without those key opinion leaders because the science is so complex. So revenues are really important. So how can we use IP assets to support our competitive advantage? The first point and suggestion I have, Patricia talked on the, this morning, um, this is your freedom to operate. In order to bring a product to market, it would be wise to be reasonably sure that you're not infringing on a bunch of people's patents who might come and sue you immediately. So a freedom to operate search and analysis and opinion is something we go through at various stages of process, product development and commercialization in order to determine whether commercialization or testing of a product can be done without infringing the valid patent rights of others. And we do searching like Patricia described to you this morning as you get closer to commercialization, you need to become more and more certain that you have freedom to operate. That's the point where we might engage a firm like Patricia's to give us a real formal legal opinion on our freedom to operate so we can confidently provide that to our investors and to any other interested stakeholders um, to give them confidence that yes, we can enter the market confidently. So on the, on the right hand side here, I've added these boxes to come back to competitive advantage. I clearly forgot to tick the boxes on this slide, I'm sorry. Um, but in general, freedom to operate, I think is very important for mitigating your competition. And I think it's important for your target market because you're increasing buyer confidence that you can move into the market successfully and investor confidence. Second on the list and how you can leverage your IP to support your competitive advantage. This is one I think people are familiar with, offense. Keeping others off the market. This is a big barrier to entry in the market. Um, you can obtain patents directed to the beneficial features of your product. That means another might not be able to generate a product with that same beneficial feature. Um, or I also note key manufacturing steps. Some of these things, the barrier to entry is really, it is tough to manufacture cell therapies, right? So if you can identify patent protection at key points, bottlenecks in your manufacturing process, that could be a really important barrier to entry and blocking patent for others. And ultimately here with your offense, you're trying to block others from practicing um, the methods and generating the products that you are practicing so that you can be the only one in the marketplace or at least take up a substantial part of the market. The next is defense. Um, here, maybe this is a little less obvious, but if you build your own patent portfolio that is both robust and in sometimes, some ways, 
this is where a big patent portfolio can be useful to you. Because you have an arsenal of patents of your own, it may, might make someone think twice before asserting their patents against you. But because perhaps you have a bucket of patents that you could assert against them in a countersuit. So that's one reason. And a startup company typically won't have a big, robust patent portfolio because, as we talked about this morning, very expensive to get there. But certainly big pharma takes this seriously. And when you get to a mid-sized company, this is a real strategy. And it's, it's directed to your competition mainly. Sale. As we said, increased revenues. That allows you to put more money back into your product development and sale. Maybe you have some patents that you could just sell or assign to another party. Um, you don't want to sell, obviously, your key patents that protect your product. But maybe you filed some, and they're no longer relevant to your commercial model. So maybe you want to generate some revenue now and use that and sell them off to somebody else who might want them. Out licensing. So here I, I step back for a second to talk about IP as, a va as an asset. And it's an asset in the same way that a property or a product could be a physical asset. But it's much more complicated, and it's governed by a different set of rules. But it can be much more valuable than a physical asset because you can divide it in a way that doesn't diminish its value. So if you had a piece of real estate, for instance, if you divided it and then sold it to two people, you might be able to make like a small, well, this is a bad example for Toronto because real estate is crazy. But let's just say you had a million dollar property. You divided it in two. You now have two smaller lots. Probably you're going to get close to a million dollars back again. In IP, an IP asset, you can divide it any number of ways and sell potentially the same thing to many, many people. So you do this when you buy your copy of Microsoft Word, for instance. They have licensed that to you for your use, but they have sold it to numerous people. Here, with an asset that would be relevant to our space, you could license the same technology non-exclusively to a number of people and generate revenue from all those different people or companies. You could also come up with a strategy where you could exclusively license a piece of technology in a specific field to one company and exclusively license that technology in a different field to another company. Say one company you license it out for oncology, another you license it out for cardiac therapy. Or if you're careful, you can do a combination of non-exclusive and exclusive licenses. <coughs> Maybe you non-exclusively license your technology for use in diagnostics or use as a research tool. But you have some exclusive licenses for specific therapeutic fields. So you need to be careful when you're carving that up. But really, if you have a bit of very valuable IP, you can sell it many times and generate real revenue from it. Cross-licensing. So this is slightly different. Cross-licensing is when you offer a license to your technology to another company in exchange for a license that you want from them. And this will often happen in two scenarios. One, when you're trying to bring in a different technology that is not in your wheelhouse already, or maybe you're trying to bring in a new, new pipeline or a new added functional feature to your product, um, or when you have a blocking patent. But maybe. So something is blocking you, but maybe you are also blocking your competitor. So you can do a swap in that way, so that both of you can move forward. So this is actually very, very advantageous and something we consider regularly in how we generate value from our IP. Facilitating partnerships. So I've given two examples here. These are not the only examples of how you would use IP to facilitate a partnership. But the first is a collaboration deal. And in a collaboration deal, generally, we work with another company to develop something using each party's assets often. We go to a company that can do something that we cannot. We work together to generate something. 
and the IP that re arises from that collaborative project, we share it or we divide it in certain ways that we agree to ahead of time. So that's a way you can leverage IP because maybe you really want to work with that company. Maybe you have something they need and want to develop. Um, the other is a co-development deal, which is slightly different. Um, but here, one partner would fund another to generate new developments. And any arising IP from those developments would be optioned or licensed to that company. This is very typical with big pharma and a smaller company. And in the biotherapeutic -thera space and the cell therapy space where I am, this is really common because it is so complicated to make these products. And manufacturing of these products is not readily available. So you get this sort of deal going on. Um, and it's, it's different than when we lived in a small molecule drug world where big pharma would take that R&D in-house and do it themselves. Now they're looking to other companies who already have the expertise and they're making these kinds of, ideal, uh, these kinds of deals, all focused on IP. Fundraising. I mentioned this at the outset. IP is a key asset that investors are looking at and considering before investing. You can see that we collated some IP and licenses from UHN and Memorial Sloan Kettering I mentioned at the outset um, in order to launch Blue Rock and we've done several deals since to support our platform and pipelines. And when investors are considering uh, investing in a company, a new company or an established company, they're doing their due diligence and looking at your IP assets to see what value they have and what predicted value they have. This is the other thing about IP assets. They're more complicated than physical assets because they can change in scope. Oftentimes you have a pending patent application. What claims, those sentences that we described, the claims that are pending when it's an application, the scope of protection might change during patent prosecution. More likely it becomes narrower at the end of the day. So when they're doing their diligence, they're looking at predicting what kind of market exclusivity you're really going to have at the end of the day on these products. So that's something I do in my job regularly, is look at that. All right building an IP portfolio. So we've talked a lot about what the value of IP assets are, how we can use them in a business um, to leverage our competitive advantage, but how do we actually build an IP portfolio? So one thing that um, we haven't delved into today is the different types of IP. We've talked mostly about patents. And then you mentioned copyright briefly in the hospital setting. So these are the, these are the major buckets of IP. And two that I'm going to highlight that we haven't talked about yet are trade secrets and know-how, because these are quite important in the life science industry. So trade secrets, when you don't want to engage in this patent bargain or this quid pro quo where you have to disclose and enable others to use and practice your invention in exchange for that 20-year exclusivity period, perhaps you want to keep your development a secret. Perhaps you don't want to share it. You don't get that market exclusivity, so you're risking that somebody else could come up with the same development that you have, but you don't have to share it. So trade secrets are particularly relevant when you have a process that cannot be easily reverse engineered. You can see this wouldn't be effective if by buying your product someone could figure out exactly how you made it. Um, and this is also appropriate where you have incremental but significant improvements um, in processes that might not rise to the level of being patentable in their own right, but they're still significant for your company and achieving that competitive advantage. Those you might want to protect as trade secrets. All information at the company that is not generally disclosed, it's not all a trade secret. In order to have a trade secret um, that you could enforce, you have to actually protect it as such. So you have to put in reasonable measures to protect the trade secret and prevent it from being disseminated to others. That could be, I mean, we do various things. You certainly use passwords. You limit who can access the trade secret. You might clearly mark it as such. 
certainly remind people on exit interviews of things that are trade secrets, and we, call, we paper it properly in agreements. Um, the other category I want to mention is know-how. And know-how in the space I work in is really important because often the information you get in a patent application, even though you have, by the letter of the law, enabled somebody to practice your invention, to make those cells, in practice there is a whole lot of nuance there to make your cells really well. Um, and a lot of that information doesn't get published. A lot of it lives in the brains of your excellent employees. So know how the first step in making that useful and valuable to a company is documenting it, getting it out of the brains of your employees or of your collaborators, of your scientific founders. And in terms of the tech transfer offices, this is often a key category of IP that is out-licensed to a startup company or an established company. Um, and in complicated spaces like cell therapy, this stuff is really key. So it's an important bucket of IP to keep an eye on and protect well. All right, mechanisms to generate IP. I've dropped these on individual slides. This is what we've talked about mostly today. So internal innovation, and this is what's going on at hospitals and universities and in your labs. And in many companies, this is going on internally as well. So we certainly have what we call a process and product development group at Blue Rock who is doing internal research. And we have internal innovation in our manufacturing as well, and you will also have it in your quality control groups. Um, there are two different types of internal innovation I wanted to mention, and maybe this is a nuance that when I say it, it will seem obvious to you, but you might not have thought about it before. There is discovery-driven innovation, and this is generally what goes on in academia, where the product or process is generated before an IP strategy is put in place. This is stuff like you realize there is a gap in the market, and that makes you decide you're going to do some early stage research on it, or an unmet need. You need a better therapeutic for, so you're going to write a grant, get some money to address that need. Um, these could also be innovations where you're troubleshooting and you come up with a significant process improvement because of that. Um, or where you have a bottleneck. Something is not working, so you need to search for a solution to that problem. Sometimes you generate that solution yourself. That is discovery-driven innovation. We do some of that in industry, but we also do a lot of strategic innovation. And this is where the strategic objective is identified before the actual innovation is made. So some examples of this are where we see a gap in the patent landscape. Nobody has taken up that space before. Maybe we see that as a valuable revenue generating field where we could drive our revenues. It is complementary to what we're working on now. Maybe we'll invest some specific resources to R&D in that space so we can generate an IP position. Blocking patents. So if you find there is a patent that you would need to practice and develop the product that you're working on, but you can't get a license to that patent, or maybe you don't want to get a license to that patent because the terms are not favorable, you can design around the patent claims. And that's an exercise we go through where we look very carefully at those claims, the sentences at the end of the patent, and we look at what each and every word means. Because in order to infringe a patent claim, you need to practice each and every element in the patent claim as it is written, supported, and enabled in the patent specification. So we often go through exercises to specifically design R&D strategies around blocking patents. It's actually very fun. Um, what's the last thing on here? Pursuing patents that would be valuable to competitors or potential partners. So sometimes you pursue IP that is not in the core of your business technology, but you develop it as a strategic play in order to have some fodder for cross-licensing with that competitor who, who has a blocking patent, um, in order to further deter your competitor's competitive advantage, 
or in order to make yourself more attractive to a potential partner who you really want to work with. Another way we generate our IP portfolios is to in-license IP generated by others. And we've talked about this quite a bit today. This is a typical strategy for startups. Um, we, uh, startups often license early stage technologies from universities. It's a strategy to add on new programs and pipelines or add on new functions to your products or um, processes. This is common in fast moving fields in particular where you don't have the internal R&D to keep pace. You might want to bring something in. Um, and common in fields where technical expertise is at a premium. So in my space, it would be much faster for us some ways um, and much more efficient to go out and in-license a new program than try to start one from scratch at Blue Rock. Um, and then the other thing, in-licensed IP, you'll find more now that there are these virtual companies. And I don't know if people will mention this this afternoon, but these are companies that they really don't have any R&D or process or product development in-house. They outsource all of it. There, they don't have a team of people to generate their own IP internally. They've got to bring it in from somewhere else. Third, fund others to generate IP for you. So we talked about two of these things already, collaboration deals and co-development deals. That's where you're working with a partner and providing resources, IP assets, or funds to generate new IP that you will share or split or divide in some way. This third category I want to spend a couple minutes on because I think it's particularly relevant to this group. These are sponsored research agreements and many of you may have worked on these um, while you're in the lab. So industry will in some cases sponsor the research of an academic key opinion leader because it's often because it's early stage research. So somebody this morning asked, how likely is it that a company would come in and invest in a technology where, I don't know if you said you didn't have animal data or you didn't have human data? I forget who asked that question. So there I thought sponsored research, right? Frequently early stage development programs, um, in order to de-risk those programs, you need to generate the animal data. You need to generate the data at larger scale or, or check these other key features. Oftentimes, industry will sponsor an academic lab to continue that research. And in exchange for those uh, research funds, they get IP and data options from it. So they get to see the results. And they might have an option to license any IP, patentable or otherwise, that arises from that research. Um, and that's something that Blue Rock does very frequently. We have sponsored research agreements with all of our advisors, um, and they're doing the early stage research um, in some cases that we're not, where we're focused more on product and process development. Another way to generate IP is to just simply buy it from others. <laughs> This is, this is a simple slide. There's not much more. You can buy it directly from the owner. There are auctions for IP. Oftentimes, a company will audit their IP annually, and they'll try to get rid of everything they don't use. And if they can't find somebody to sell it to without too much trouble, they'll send it to someone who will auction it off. And you hope to get a bit of revenue back. Or maybe this will happen when a company goes under. Maybe all their IP will go to to an auction house. Um, the other bullet point I put here, and I personally do not have experience in this, but I am aware of others who have crowdsourced IP assets. And this is a pretty cool model. You have to be careful papering it. Um, but you could put out a call for somebody to invent a solution to a problem you have. They submit those solutions to some central um, platform, and then you could look at them all and award a prize to the winner. So long, but by, by making that submission, they would have to assign all their IP rights to you in the process. Um, so I've never done this. Blue Rock hasn't done this. I don't think Blue Rock will do this, but I thought it was worth noting. Um, it's a cool idea. So finally, I just wanted to 
take this back to a higher level and talk about how IP fits into a corporate strategy. So I have like a real deal dream job right now for me. My job at Blue Rock sits me squarely in the legal department. I am interfacing with our R&D team every day and with our business team. So I get exposed to all sorts of aspects of business and all sorts of different types of technology. It's pretty awesome. And this, this I'm trying to illustrate how this works. Um, so let's start at R&D and manufacturing because that's like the heart of, of a business. If we don't have this, we don't have a product. So R&D is directed by corporate to meet certain goals in making a product or process. And corporate recommends that they are resourced accordingly so that they can do what they need to do. So they can provide data and results and new early products to the company. That's between your light blue and your gray box there. In terms of IP, IP is providing guidance to the R&D team in order to guide and capture high value innovation. So I go to lab meetings regularly. I go to a lot of meetings. Um, so I'm keeping up to speed on the improvements and developments so that I can be there to capture the really important and valuable ones. And then we can get the patent or trade secret process going. And so I can deliver that information to corporate. Um, IP is providing corporate with competitive intelligence and either actual IP assets or IP advice to leverage their corporate goals. And certainly R&D is giving to me their invention disclosures and developments, that sort of thing. And in turn, if things go well, you have a clinical product at some point. That clinical product is generating sales for your company. So your company is growing, and then your company can provide resources back to R&D and manufacturing in order to resource future pipelines and improvements on your current pipelines. The success of those clinical products that you're having in the market, that's fueling the value of your IP assets, which increases your company value and gives you more opportunity um, for company growth and partnership. And the IP assets are giving your clinical products a competitive advantage. So they're helping you with that market exclusivity. So this is, of course, a very simplified <laughs> description of a corporate strategy and how this fits. And there are many, many other factors at play here. But this is just to give you an idea at a high level how valuable IP assets and IP advice um, fits into, into a biotech company. And that's all I have. So I'd be glad to answer any questions if we have a couple minutes. Absolutely.